doing these calls um, uh, very periodically with some of our past cohorts of participants from different years. Um, we do this usually at the about this time every year after coming through the seminar, just to check back in. Welcome, Nino. Actually, this maybe we'll give it just a second as we have a few more people that are coming in. Looks like Olga is joining us as well. Hi guys, how Hi. are you? Hi, Hello. Nino. Hi, Olga. Hello. I don't see anything, but someone who I probably know. Welcome. Oh, Welcome. oh, I have my Star Wars. Good, Viola. Here we are. Hi, guys. It's so cool to see all of you safe and alive. Oh, my goodness. So good to hear your voice. Oh, wait. <laughs> Let me do this. Right on. Okay, well. We'll continue then, and um, as I was just mentioning, we're just doing these check-ins. Uh, we usually do this every seminar anyways, uh, about this time, uh, roughly eight months to 12 months after the seminar. We decided to hold this one a little bit earlier than we normally would, just so we could check in with everybody and see, see how people are doing in this world that looks very different than when we were all standing at the entrance to Yellowstone National Park uh, just uh, a few short months ago. It feels like so. Um, basically, um, Aaron's going to provide us with an overview of, of some of the key features on how to use Zoom. This is becoming less and less necessary since we're all becoming experts on all the video conferencing platforms that are out there. But just to make sure, um, and then we'll just open it up uh, for a little bit of uh, general discussion. We want to check in with everybody, and then we have we had a few guiding questions that we sent out ahead of time that uh, are mostly uh, COVID related, just to hear how you guys are individually, institutionally um, are adjusting uh, both to the challenges, but also some of the creative solutions that you guys are coming up with for uh, how to move forward and whatever the world's gonna look like once we uh, get through this initial uh, storming, storming phase. So with that, I'll, I'll ask Aaron to go ahead and give us uh, a quick rundown on, on how to use some of the features of Zoom. Thank you so much, Ryan, and welcome all. It's really good to hear everyone's voices and look forward to hearing more how you're doing. Um, this, is, this is a very informal webinar, but uh, just to keep it a little orderly and make sure that everyone can hear each other and, and that uh, the connection is not too weighed down by video, we're gonna ask if you have any questions, you can write it in the chat. I hear a couple people entering, so welcome those who are entering. Happy and uh, Tom Tom just and Gabby, us. welcome. We're just starting. Um, at, when we have our discussion, uh, you can raise your hand to be called on so we have one person talking at a time. And right now we're gonna ask that everyone keeps their video off, but when you have a chance to talk, you'll be able to turn your video on during that time. Uh, and you could turn and turn off your video uh, by the button that says start video or stop video. And while other people are speaking, we'll kindly ask that you keep your microphone muted so that we don't have too much interference. I'm sure you guys are experts by now, but just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. Great, thanks Thanks so much, Aaron, for, for giving us that, uh, that brief overview. Um, we have a few more people that it looks like are still still joining us, which is great. And so just one more time, on behalf of uh, Colorado State University's Center for Protected Area Management and the U.S. Forest Service International Programs, we're really happy to uh, welcome you all back to this virtual gathering. Uh, it won't be the same as we're walking through the, the mountains of, uh, of Grand Teton National Park or the Black Hills National Forest, but at least we can see each other's uh, wonderful faces and uh, hear from each other and, and, uh, and provide some support where we can as well. So with that in mind, um, we'd love to just go through and have anybody provide us with just a brief overview of uh, how things are going on your end, and then uh, later we'll get into the more in-depth uh, reflection questions. And so uh, um, instead of having you uh, raise your hand one by one, I'll just go ahead and call you out one by one, if that sounds good. And uh, we can start by, um, let's see here. How about, let's start with 
Olga. Mic on, do you know? There, now, yeah. now you're good. Okay. Well, it's such a great opportunity to see everyone there virtually, but I'm so happy we have such a chance to get together again. Looks like our life is going to be a little bit virtual for the next few years, I guess, right? What do you think? <laughs> do you guys hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, we are, well, it's, it's really hard to call the situation normal. It's very abnormal, very weird. And we are ready for weeks, for four weeks, uh, six weeks of the lockdown, and we're on self isolation. We're not supposed to go farther than 100 meters from, my, from our place of residence. Of course, no travel in between cities unless there is really. Uh, a good need, a good reason for that. Parks and national parks and reserves are all closed. Definitely, in uh, we all move to online and do this all these virtual tours. It's kind of a weird situation. But I must say, for Russia, it's getting a little bit more stable. Well, I'm afraid to say that 100%. But it looks like we are reaching that plateau that everyone is talking about. Uh, if you're interested, I can I can give you some figures. So as of today, May 12th, I prepared to give you I'll give you some figures. So we have a little bit less than 11,000 new cases totally in Russia, uh, bringing the total count to 2,323 almost thousand, including 121 just in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So we are, and we only have up to now only a level of 2,116 deaths. But the number of recovered people is also gradually rising, and we have, as of today, 43,512 uh, recovered, including 19,600 people recovered in Moscow. Of course, the most of cases is located in Moscow, but uh, I'm, I think we're getting the plateau, because if compared to the beginning of May, mm -hmm. figures, we are getting more or less stable number of uh, uh, new cases every day. It ranges about eight, 10,000 new cases. Mm -hmm. And the government actually, actually yesterday, president announced uh, a gradual step-by-step -step, uh, easing of the lockdown uh, restrictions based on the region. So I think it means that very soon, at least by the end of May, I guess, in a couple of weeks, we will definitely be, we in Moscow, will definitely will be somewhere at one of the first, first or second stage of uh, lifted restrictions. And I'm sure the walks to the parks and uh, locations farther than 100 meters from home will be allowed. And I think for parks, it's going to be quite an interesting period. It's kind of a not sort of back to normal, but sort of back to some new normal environment. Mm -hmm. So I think they should be uh, prepared for getting more visitors. If they get to get no one today, they'll get more people uh, in a couple of weeks. And I must say, the research shows that people have a terrible demand for, for, for being in, in nature, being in parks. Uh, seeing nature actually, seeing biodiversity, biodiversity. So I think parks uh, will be facing very interesting time in, in a, if not two weeks, then a month for, for sure. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Olga. Thanks for the update. Uh, now let's see if we can hear from Tom. Hello, everyone. Hello, Tom. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Good to hear your voice. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I almost missed this very important uh, Zoom call. Uh, I thought uh, it was supposed to be my, my East African time of around 5 to 6 p.m., but I, I kept on checking on Google the entire time, and I saw it was approaching uh, very fast and very early, and then I just decided to break uh, from everything and join this very important call. I feel um, uh, very happy seeing your faces again, hearing your voices. Uh, uh, and it's very unfortunate uh, that we are amidst uh, this pandemic 
uh, it's just like how normally uh, we experience drought. But you see, for this particular case, it's the whole globe experiencing the same thing. Uh, we are in the same situation uh, of difficulty. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, we, 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 we are a little bit lucky in Samburu. Still, we have not recorded any case of uh, uh, COVID-19. But in Kenya, we already have, by today, we, we will be having over 700 uh, of such. Uh, our airport, uh, international borders, was closed for over 60 days now. Uh, tourism is absolutely zero. Even domestic tourism, uh, nothing is happening at the moment. We closed all our hotels. It's only now the rangers who are working in the conservancy. Uh, the non-ranger staff have been given um, permission to work at home, uh, but we are on standby whenever uh, whoever is needed, we just call upon and we get whatever work is needed to be done. Uh, uh, and that's just how uh, things are operating as of now. We have never been in this situation just on February, in February this year, we could not help. Uh, things could, could turn out this way. All the businesses in town are closed, curfew, uh, beginning 7 uh, p.m. Uh, in the dark. And uh, the cessation of movement in and out of our cities, that is Nairobi and Mombasa. And even within those cities, uh, there's lockdown in some estates that the cases of COVID are spiking. Uh, our businesses trade are affected because some of the procurement we may need to do in Nairobi now cannot reach us, uh, uh, you see. Uh, definitely international uh, tourism is zero and uh, revenues for second quarter to our conservancy will be zero. Not even the domestic tourists are going to visit. Uh, we have tried to uh, apply uh, measures of, uh, as in that is uh, for prevention, uh, the sanitary uh, uh, gear uh, of installing containers, uh, soaps, sanitizers, and also sensitization of members of staff, community outreach, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of activities have been halted. The government is stepping in that uh, anything beyond 10 people cannot happen. Now they have said any gathering beyond uh, above four people is not allowed. A, a create a WhatsApp group. So a lot is at stakes uh, as we speak. And uh, we are also following what is happening at the international front. Uh, in, uh, I'd like to register uh, my sincere uh, condolences to the many families uh, that have lost their loved ones and those who are still uh, uh, fighting for their lives uh, in hospital. This thing has really blown out of portions and uh, it, it, it's just so scary how it's going. Uh, we're also following what the superpowers are doing about it, uh, US, uh, Britain, France, uh, because you see now the world uh, spotlight is on them. Uh, can you come up with a solution? Is there a vaccine? How soon? You just see these things coming up. You see Oxford University in Britain uh, trying to do some human... Uh, or am, I, am I going out of topic? No, you're fine. You're fine, Tom. Yeah, yeah, some human clinical tests and stuff like that. But uh, also our Minister for Tourism is saying Kenya is going to take another two years to recover, to get things on tourism to go back to normal. Because even if you get a vaccine for COVID, then it will mean we are going to have a slow start. And before we get to that normal uh, uh, graph, it, it, it will be like another two years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thank you for the update. Appreciate it. Um, let's now go for an update to Georgia, to Nino. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, it's good to see you, and I hope all of you are good and healthy. <laughs> So what uh, is happening in Georgia? So um, we have uh, we um, are in uh, lockdown for the third months already, and um, we have more than 650 uh, cases. 
But good thing is that uh, more than half of these cases, they are already recovered and they are in self-isolation in their home. So every day, the number of new cases is uh, less than uh, uh, the recovered people's number. So it's good. We have for this moment about 11 cases of deaths. Uh, all of um, visitor centers and national parks or other tourist information centers or museums or all of these kind of organizations are closed already from uh, 12 of March and um, uh, but for our case for example in Borjomi Harakauli National Park and in most of the national parks protection division is still working so our rangers are patrolling and they are working and doing the stuff uh, like as usual. Um, uh, uh, regarding our uh, like new newses from our premier minister and government, uh, we are going to open uh, like our tour, let's say tourist season from the uh, beginning of June. So uh, I will be at work uh, from first of June, and we will be ready to uh, host our visitors, but only uh, for Georgian visitors for the first stage, and from uh, July fifteenth. As they say, the country will be ready to host also um, foreign visitors as well. And uh, there are several cities, several uh, places in Georgia, about uh, five of them, which is um, like announced like a green zone for tourism and for uh, so it's very safe to to uh, come to Georgia like a uh, visitors, but we have to do a lot to prepare for it like a. Uh, um, different stages like to using the masks and this, this kind of stuff everything we don't have this kind of experience but we will try our best thank you thanks nino thanks for the update now let's go to batior hello everyone i'm so glad to hear all your voices uh, <clears throat> I hope you are doing well and uh, staying healthy. So, some updates from, first of all, I would like to uh, convey Svetlana's greetings. She said, unfortunately, she's in another call related to work. That's why she couldn't join, but she sends her uh, warmest greetings to everyone. Uh, we've been teleworking from home for two months now. Uh, in lockdown, borders are closed, fl flights are canceled and will not they don't plan to um, reinstall the flights until July 1st. The country is uh, divided into three zones, red zone, where uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 is last 14 days uh, uh, where, where we had cases, a yellow zone where we didn't have cases, and green zone where there are no cases. Uh, transportation between provinces is not allowed, so uh, obviously, nobody can go to any touristic places or uh, or parks. Uh, within the city, we are allowed to move to drive our car from 7 to 10 a.m. and from 5 to 8 p.m. for grocery or for to go to barbershops or to clinics or whatever. Tourism sector is affected very badly. Where uh, for last three or four years, Uzbekistan was paying a great attention to tourism sector as a catalyst for GDP, but now uh, it affected very, very badly. We have 2,509 cases, and luckily, we two, more than 2,000 are recovered, which is 98%, and we have 10 deaths. I think it's uh, one of the unique situations. This is it from my side. Okay. Thank you, Batio, for the update. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see if we can now go to Jerry, who's joining us from Techno Common 12 Pro. <laughs> can you hear us, Jerry? It looks like it looks like Jerry's audio is not. Yeah, connected. that's what I was just gonna say. I don't know if he's connected to audio. And just to let you know, if Flavi is still on, she's on a, a a side meeting, so she's just listening in right now. Okay, well then let's go to the person who's next on my list who just happened to join us. Her name shows up as Keen, but we all know her as Carolina. Do you want to give us an update, Carolina? Hello. <clears throat> Do you see me? Because 
here is blackout. I think uh, though I'm open video, you cannot see me. <laughs> but we can feel your positive energy, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Hello. So Carolina, if you want, what's what we're doing? Basically, I know you just um, um, joined us, but everybody is just giving like a one or two minute update on how what's the situation in their country. So if you want to just give us a few minutes, just one or two minutes about how things are going there, let, please let us know. Um, here uh, we have at uh, until uh, uh, May fifteen, we have an announcement uh, not to uh, go. Uh, some are partially locked down, but uh, for the office and organization, they are uh, starting to open. But there are lots of guidelines, uh, you know, for those organizations who are going to, uh, you know, resume everything. But from even for me, uh, I am, uh, you know, stuck in the Mandalay. It's the middle of Myanmar. I cannot go back to the Yangon because Yangon is the, uh, the, the, you know, the outbreak area. But stay in Myanmar, there is only one, 176 positive uh, cases. Uh, most of them, have, or nearly half of them, have already recovered. But <clears throat> the government is stay, uh, you know, uh, you know, doing all the responses. So we are stay. It's now stopping, you know, 176 cases. But everything is fine. But uh, for the organization. Uh, they are not, uh, for example, like for the factories, uh, they, uh, they can reopen, but they have to uh, follow, you know, many, many, you know, many, many um, guidelines they have to follow. So some of the factories, they, uh, you know, get out of the country because, you know, they cannot uh, open in here. But for the um, uh, protected area, uh, from from Myanmar, uh, most of the visitors they are not going to the protected area. Uh, only the uh, you know uh, the, the the staff and some uh, you know uh, related person they are going to the uh, uh, national park. Uh, most of the most of the uh, you know the crowded area, the public area are you know related with the religious and religion. Uh, the places which, which is related to religion and culture. So all those places are closed down, are not open yet. But for the organization, we are still waiting for, you know, uh, what will happen after May 15. So it's uh, still waiting for, you know, but for the time being, we are staying at home. Great, thank you, Hello. Carolina. Yeah. Thank you for the update. Uh huh. Yeah. Now let's go next to uh, Julio. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all again and talk to you. Um, yeah, we're facing difficult times, um, and. Brazil so far, and I think uh, uh, none of my Brazilian mates are here, but um, we, we have a lot of cases around the, the country, and unfortunately with a lot of losses uh, that uh, topped already 10,000 losses. Um, and bringing on to my specific uh, scenario here, uh, we didn't have any cases yet in the town I'm living, uh, which is two hours uh, from Brasilia. But uh, our neighboring towns already have some cases and we have one loss uh, in a neighbor town. So we expect soon to have uh, some cases here. We actually are expecting it to come uh, uh, this month, um, and uh, we're we're very afraid of it because we have no structure. We have don't have hospital here, so we have to uh, have support from Brasilia, the capital. And Brasilia is one of the main uh, infected towns, um, so it's not gonna be easy to deal with that when it reaches here. Um, 
And about our uh, protected areas and parks, there is an um, uh, instruction from the federal government to shut down all uh, protected areas from SMBU and also the state level and uh, uh, municipal level are all uh, shut down. Um, so facing that situation, um, all our region here depends much on tourism to survive. So um, a lot of the population here, I would uh, even say 80% of the population are dependent on the economically from the tourism. So we came up with a solidarity campaign to help out uh, those people who are not being able to work during this time. Uh, and we, we were able to raise uh, already uh, around 60,000 reais, that would be around $10,000 to buy um, uh, food and supplies for these people. And so far we've been able to, to have a horizon to give support to the, to the vulnerable families for the next two or three months, which uh, is the time that we hope that the, the worst of this uh, passes. So it's, it's the good part of it. We see a, a, a good um, uh, engagement and, and solidarity support coming in. Um, and uh, as for uh, our organization in specific, we are, um, together in this network uh, of solidarity uh, in the coordinating. Uh, and we have recently also uh, signed a cooperation agreement with SMBU and with our national park that uh, we have a work plan for the next five years to develop uh, a lot of projects with the park. And one of them is to uh, promote and help the public use of our park. So um, we came up with um, uh, an idea with the management of the park that uh, we will do field uh, work and field trips during this uh, shutdown of the park to uh, find and uh, uh, look for new trails or inspect the, the existing trails to see where um, we can do uh, management. So we're doing uh, this, of course, with uh, all the, the sanitary uh, um, procedures. Uh, so we're doing only uh, in two people or at most three people. Usually it's one member of AVE and one member of the SMBU, and we go in the field with masks and uh, with uh, uh, all the procedures, but we've been able to do reports that are gonna be useful uh, uh, for, for the management of the park during this time. So this is a way we, we, we find a way to keep our, working, our work going on. And also we, of course, uh, a lot of the, the work is being done virtually now. So we, we increase our uh, communication effort for AVE to, to have more people in, uh, to be friends of the park and also to engage in our solidarity campaign, donating funds and it's been working well. Um, and, um, yeah, the other topics I, I listed on to, to, to share with you, it was the, the past, uh, post-pandemic scenarios. And um, we're looking into um, a scenario where um, in, in about two, three months, we're gonna, we're gonna have uh, a, a reopen, uh, 
of the tourism here, there's been a lot of pressure already from, especially from uh, uh, the big uh, entrepreneurs here. Um, but uh, it's been hold so far. Uh, but I think in the next two, three months, it, it's gonna be inevitable to, to reopen. And I think it can be done gradually and with uh, good uh, uh, standards on sanitation. But of course, it's not gonna be uh, near what it was in the past, especially because of the logistics. Uh, most of our tourists here would come from Rio, Sao Paulo and other places. And of course, because of the, uh, there's not planes flying, 93% of the planes uh, in Brazil are, are canceled uh, on the routes. So uh, we believe it's going to be mostly regional uh, tourists that would come, uh, especially from Brasilia or Guiana, the, the nearby capitals. And, um, but we're going to have to be prepared for that. And uh, there's one big question, and I, 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 I ask if any of you know, but we're, uh, we're also asking for health professionals if the virus is transmitted by water. Uh, this is a main question we're trying to figure out here to see if, uh, if we in, in this reopen uh, plan, we're gonna be able to let people swim in the rivers or not. This is a, is a question. And also we're, we're questioning ourselves what is gonna be the capacity limit of people on trails, for example. We already have that mainly for environmental uh, standards, but we're discussing now what would be the sanitary standards for uh, a capacity of tourists on a trail. And to, to end, uh, another, uh, question and reflection I'd like to, to, to give out in the group is uh, it's um, about um, the CCC uh, efforts we learned with you, the Civilian uh, Conservation Corps. And I've been thinking uh, a lot about it during these times. And I'm glad again, and thank you for, for uh, teaching us that because I think we're going to be able to, to face uh, or to build a plan really uh, 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 similar to that. And I'm really keen here to, to uh, put efforts on, on planning that, uh, build a new model and specific for Brazil, for example, to design and, and build infrastructure to receive those uh, that we believe that after pandemic, after all these quarantine times in urban areas, people are going to be really looking into uh, uh, tourism in protected areas in natural places. But we're going to have, uh, especially in Brazil, that uh, we have uh, um, a big lack of infrastructure in parks. We need to, to have a really big um, investment in that and I believe a model like CCC would be really uh, good for um, our situation here. That's it for, for now. Thanks Julio, appreciate the update. And, and we can, we'll circle back to your questions here once we get into more of the discussion and we've not, noted down the, the two comments you specifically had regarding you know, what be, whether this is waterborne or not and, and uh, in the, in, the, in the CCC. Let, let's continue on. I understand that Flavia is listening. So hello, Flavia. We wish you could talk to us, but we understand that you're connected on another call. We hope you're safe and sound in your cable car. And next we'll go to Uyen. Let's see if, we, there we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Hi, guy. Hello. Okay, can you hear me and can you see me? I can hear you. Hi, Uyen. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay, so this is from Vietnam. Um, 
actually from the beginning of the COVID-19, I always wonder how you guys are, what you guys are doing. Is that everyone safe or not? And today is really happy to see 13 of us here. So I hope that the rest of us are still okay. I really hope that we can have more updates from other participants. Uh, so in Vietnam, uh, to date we had almost 300 cases, uh, nobody died, died yet, and we hope that we can keep it forever, nobody died for COVID-19. So sorry for US for moving so quickly and going to like top of the list. Uh, but I heard that you are controlling the case, right? Uh, in US. Um, so uh, in Vietnam, we had a lot of things. The government do a lot of things from the beginning, from February. Uh, for example, all children uh, doesn't go to school from the February until today. Uh, today, my children go to school again. Um, and uh, from the 1st of April, we closed down all the flights in the country. I mean, international flight in the country and out of the country. And the whole country is under the social distancing. It means we have to stay home, don't go out. Uh, and all the services closing down. All the flight from city to city is closed. Only a few big cities and all the buses from city to city is also stopped. Uh, so we, we were really strict on that. And um, maybe because of that, then now we had only 288 cases and nobody died yet. Um, and uh, the tourism is uh, strongly affected uh, as in any other countries, as you know. Uh, so all the tourism activity to national parks is also closed down from April, the 1st of April until the end of April. So a few days ago, that's a few days ago, uh, they will uh, open up again, but uh, people are still like so hesitant to go to the national parks, to go on tourists again, and especially go and, um, how to say, contact with the wildlife because, you know, COVID-19, uh, every people think that it comes from bats and wildlife. So uh, the advice is that don't go out and don't touch wildlife. So that's why all the like nature tourism is strongly affected. Um, all of our camps and field trips is also canceled. Um, uh, and uh, right now, when the children start to go back to school, we hope that the tourism activity will start back again. And our camp, we try to start another camp in about two weeks more. Let's see if people want to go. But um, based on the situation in Vietnam, I think that we are controlling it really good because right now all the flight from other country to Vietnam people have to be separate for 14 days uh, but actually the risk is still there because there are still guys who are affected and someone who uh, people think that they are recovered but then they are infected again um, so for now it's really uncertain uh, we don't know if um, the tourism can really go back or um, maybe we hope that only the domestic tourism can go back um, also I also would like to raise the question to you guys do you guys think that when people go on the tourism on a field trip for example when they keep the distance of two meters away from each other is that safe or if someone infected, everybody would, um, would also be infected. Yes, that's from me. Great, thank you, Uyen. And um, we'll, Hi. We'll, we appreciate it. Let's, let's go to our, the last person that hasn't been able to update. So let's go to Malawi and see if Tadala can turn her sound on and give us an update from Malawi. I am trying to unmute Tadala, but it's not letting me. Tadala, can you try to unmute yourself? Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe she's having some trouble. I know she, I've seen that she's come in and out a few times. Um, so yeah, feel free something. to come back to us, Tadala, if you're able to get your sound uh, turned on so that you can uh, speak. Um, otherwise, we'll continue on with the call. Um, I just wanted to provide a quick update uh, to you all on our situation from, on, from the team here in the U.S. Um, and then any of the other team members can, uh, Aaron and Jim can also chime in if they want to provide some additional information. Um, I'm going to turn my video on just to see if that'll work. 
Um, basically, um, I probably, as you all have seen, um, the U.S. has had a pretty hard hit of the of COVID nineteen. Um, I think we're around one point four million cases, and uh, almost eighty two thousand people have uh, passed away, have died from COVID nineteen. Uh, in Colorado, we're right around 20,000 cases in our state and uh, right around, almost 1,000 deaths in, in the state of Colorado. Um, because of that, we've been, like many of you, on lockdown for about eight weeks now. Um, we've just started to transition to uh, um, the initial phase of opening, which is not much different than lockdown, really. People still are encouraged to only stay within 10 miles of your home. Um, we don't have as many restrictions on movement, let's say, as some other countries have expressed. You can still drive around in your car. You can still go to the grocery store as many times whenever you want. Um, here in Colorado, it's different than other parts where our local and municipal and city uh, uh, parks and protected areas are still open. Of course, you always have to apply social distancing and, and be careful on, on uh, you know, going out just you're with your family and not not in large groups, but uh, we've found that that has brought a lot of uh, mental health and physical health benefits to people during lockdown. At least being able to go out and take a walk or go on a run, um, that kind of thing. But it's not been the same all across the U.S. and it's also highlighting a lot of in, um, inequalities in our country about who has access to. Um, uh, local parks and open space. And for us, at least, it really highlights the need for a lot more work on, on urban protected areas so that more people living in these large cities have more access to green space. Um, so we've been um, taking advantage of those uh, local protected areas. I, with my kids who have now been homeschooling for, for seven weeks, um, you know, we use that as an opportunity to get out and go on a walk several times a day. Um, I can go with my son climbing in, 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 our, in some of our nearby protected areas as well. Obviously, always with social distancing, which is hard with the, with the kids, as I'm sure it is and with, for all of you. The ki kids, especially teenagers, are so used to spending time with their family that it's so hard to try to explain. And, and especially when some of their friends may not be social distancing and not listening to the rules, and, and that makes it harder. Um, we're facing, I think, some challenges here in the U.S. We, our curve has stabilized. But it's probably going to be what they say a long tail because um, we have some areas like New York in the northeastern part of the U.S. that are starting to get a better control of things. But we have other parts of the country that never really went into full lockdown that um, those cases in those parts of the country are starting to rise. And so um, it's going to be a bit of a challenge uh, everywhere. But I think it's going to be a, a special, special challenge here in the United States. Um, we, we're not, many of our citizens are not very good at listening to the government when they tell us what we need to do to be safe. And so you have a lot of people that aren't listening to the government recommendations. Um, just for example, on Mother's Day on Sunday, um, uh, we had a restaurant in Colorado that fully opened up and had hundreds of people inside the restaurant. Nobody was wearing masks and the, the state government had to, sh had to, had to take away the operational license for that restaurant, but all the people were going out there specifically as a sign that they were not in agreement with the government's measures. So it, we, we still face um, that challenge. We also face the challenge of, of having a very decentralized government. So we have certain regulations or, or suggestions at the federal level coming from the, from the White House, but then each state has a different governor that might be operationalizing those suggestions in a very different way. And so it's a very piecemeal um, uh, situation on how people are responding. And so that, I think, adds to the challenges that we're going to be facing probably probably through most of the rest of this year, if not beyond. So that's just a brief update uh, from, from, from the U.S. Um, I'm not sure if Jim or Aaron, if you want to chime in and provide any additional updates on what's happening here. Um, I just to add that um, in terms of, I mentioned the local parks, in terms of the national parks and forest, forest reserves, uh, for national forests, um, uh, over 50% of, of our federal protected areas have also remained open. Um, the, all visitor centers, all bathrooms, all 
you know, programming or interpretive talks, anything that involves a gathering of people, those have all been shut down. But um, many of the even federal protected areas have been able to find a way to at least keep trails open or other things open so people have a space um, to recreate. Um, many of the big parks, Yellowstone, Rocky Mountain National Park, Grand Teton, those kinds of places have been closed. Um, Jim or Aaron, any updates? Yeah, just to add just a little bit to what uh, Ryan said, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I've been using our state parks regularly because they never closed, but the visitor centers did, the campgrounds did, and any and uh, the restrooms did actually. They put in porta potties, but uh, portable restrooms, but the regular restrooms uh, all closed. And people have continued to use them because, uh, as Ryan mentioned, Rocky Mountain National Park has been closed. Our national forest and other areas that do not have an entrance gate have, for the most part, remained open. Again, bathrooms have been locked, and any place where there were agglomerations of people have been shut down. I will mention that our most visited national park, Great Smoky Mountains, in Tennessee and North Carolina, reopened this weekend to hordes of visitors. People, the one of the rangers counted license plates from 20 some states there. So there, what we know is that there's incredible pent up demand to travel, locally and regionally in particular. A lot of people are probably gonna, it's gonna be a while before they wanna get on a cruise ship, in an airplane, in a crowded uh, airport terminal, uh, on a bus, but we expect uh, demand for local and regional tourism and car-based visitation in small groups to be very strong and to lead the way for recovery. Um, our Centers for Disease Control has actually put out, I'll see if I can get it to all of you, guidelines for parks and recreation agencies on sanitary measures they can take, uh, going back to Julio's, Julio's uh, question about uh, uh, is it waterborne? And we know it is shed in feces, but we don't know if it can actively uh, contaminate people or not. But anyway, lots of good researchers are spending a lot of time and effort to look at these things so that we can reopen uh, safely. So for all of you that live in countries and work in parks that are tourism dependent, my advice based on our experience here is that prepare for strong demand, particularly locally and regionally. And if you have depended almost entirely on international tourism, this would be a good time to rethink those strategies, to have lots of legs on your table and to think about alternatives for local and regional tourism uh, to open back up slowly, even if obviously it doesn't have the same economic impact as high-end international visitors. But there's gonna be a lot of pent up local and regional demand. So try to deal with that. Uh, try to follow all the guidelines on sanitation, uh, possibly close uh, uh, areas that are uh, prone to be very crowded, like one-way trails to an overlook, and uh, try to learn from this and uh, also think about diversifying your financial strategies as well. And on that point, uh, I will be on a uh, webinar this Friday with a colleague from Canada, Paul Eagles, in a TAPAS, an IUCN Tourism and Protectory Specialist Group webinar. Um, and I think Aaron's going to be sending out on F Facebook and WhatsApp a reminder about that to talk about how we might face some of the financial challenges that tourism dependent communities and, and NGOs and protected area government agencies can respond and rebound from this current crisis. Thank you all and wish you all the best in your efforts. And we, uh, in addition to these uh, just check-in sessions, we will be hosting a series of webinars as well uh, starting in, in June. Uh, we're gonna be hosting the webinars on sustainable tourism and COVID, um, the role of the park ranger um, in these trying and difficult times, and also uh, a webinar on financial resilience uh, post COVID. And so we will, once we get those scheduled with the Forest Service, we're gonna have speakers from around the world and uh, we'll be have participants from the US Forest Service as well. Uh, once we have those uh, put together, we will share those with you as well. Okay, um, great. Aaron, did you wanna contribute to what Jim said? I just wanted to mention regarding the Tapas webinar that Jim will be participating in. I already posted that on our Facebook. So go to our Facebook and you'll get all the connection information to get registered for the webinar. And just Audrey and I would like to say hi. I believe our video is on. We're not going to add 
anything but just to say hi and so good to hear from everybody and uh, good to hear that everyone is healthy and well. So we'll continue on. Thanks, Aaron and Audrey. Um, well, so we have in front of you, if you able to see your screen, we had uh, three reflection questions and, and we don't have to go uh, in these in order. Um, we just wanted to put them out there to see if anyone uh, wanted to uh, make any comments on them. So I'll read the three questions and then um, if anybody would like to uh, chime in, uh, join us for the conversation, we would uh, invite you either to raise your hand through the, through the um, through that feature on Zoom, or just let us know by uh, turning your audio on. Um, but you know, as we've been thinking about all of you in our broader network of collaborators around the world, we've been thinking about how different organizations have been adapting to the COVID-19 situation. Um, we have, as our center, we've had to adapt. We've had to cancel all of our seminars through the end of this year. And um, we are also concerned that it might also be possible that uh, some of our funders might be canceling uh, seminars even through to 2021. So we're still waiting for more information to learn how we're going to adapt and how much of what we do have to be online. So those kinds of things we're kind of interested and curious to hear from um, any of you. We're also interested in, in new opportunities or new creative ideas that you're, that you're already seeing in your work. And we heard a little bit from Julio about some of the things that they're doing with ECMEBU. And then finally, you know, how might long-term changes in visitor numbers and visitation patterns um, affect uh, your institution, affect your protected area systems, affect local communities and local businesses that depend on tourism revenues, and what are you thinking about uh, that might help you build some, some financial resilience uh, moving forward? Um, obviously, we're all living in a world of uncertainty, and, and, and we're not sure when things will open back up or when this quote-unquote new normal Will, 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 be, will be upon us. And um, from everything that, uh, that, that we're seeing, it's, you know, and some of the epidemiologists that are coming out and speaking uh, more recently um, have indicated this, you know, this may be in some parts of the world, especially hard hit, like the US, we may be looking at a three year time frame before we truly are back to some new normal and, and periods of up and downs and throughout. So, um, with that in mind, we'll leave you with those reflection questions and we look for anybody from the group that might want to chime in and talk a little bit about what, what you have going on. Hey, and Ryan, I think Tadala's uh, microphone is working, so we might want to give her a chance to give an update as well. Okay, great. Yeah, Tadala, if you are available to, to speak and just provide us with an update from Malawi, that would be great. Or maybe not. I'm trying to unmute her. Um, she had messaged that she was ready and available. Um, Tadal, if you can unmute yourself. There she is. Hi, Erin. I'm here. Hi, Tadal. Good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, I think I'm having a bad reception on my end, but I just try to update you guys on the current situation uh, in Malawi at the moment. I hope you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. A little echo, but we can hear you clear. Okay. So, basically, at the moment, um, since uh, we started registering COVID-19 cases in Malawi, we have registered about 57 cases, of which three of them died and 24 recovered. Um, we haven't had any lockdown. and. Yeah, the president uh, requested that we have a 21 day lockdown, but it was turned down because there weren't proper measures to handle the lockdown situation put in place. So people were reluctant to go on lockdown for 21 days. Um, at the moment, uh, things are business, it's business as usual for Mal most Malawians, but we're also taking account on the measures that are put in place, like social distancing in some places, it's working, and in other places like markets, it's not working. Like our offices, we're trying to like uh, put the measures in place to say maybe we shouldn't be in crowded places. Um, schools closed on March 22nd, so we haven't been had, having like um, outreach programs with schools and school programs. 
uh, even students are not visiting the park. And for the park, we don't have visitors at the moment because uh, of the COVID-19. So ever since we started registering cases, like the park has been much affected in terms of visitations. We no longer have visitors. We can no longer have student groups come to a park because schools are closed. And we, all, we have also limited, we are also limited on the community outreach programs. We can no longer hold maybe massive um, uh, awareness meetings. So that's pretty much it on my end, but um, it's still business as usual in most areas in Malawi to say people who have not responded so much on COVID-19 because there are rumors that maybe we not, might not be having the cases that are not being reported, but all in all, we are all trying to stay safe so that maybe we can prevent the coronavirus. Yeah, so basically that's right about Malawi at the moment. Thank you to Dala for for uh, providing us with that update. And and uh, we wish you good luck in keeping the numbers down, despite the fact that it sounds like you guys are open for business. And so we'll see how, how things go. Hopefully it, the social distancing will help. Um, does, would anybody like to, uh, to join the conversation related to any of these reflection questions? Um, how have your organizations been adapting? Any new creative ideas you've come up with or or how these long-term changes do you think might be affecting your your business, your institution, your protected area, your local communities? I'll go ahead and start and then give you all the time to think about uh, how, how you might like to chime in. One of the things that we're already dealing with is um, we, as I mentioned, we had to cancel the, our Spanish language protected area course in July. We had to cancel the tourism seminar in September. And uh, the next seminar we had was our October uh, women's leadership and conservation seminar, which was going to be held in English for the first time. And uh, we did cancel the the face-to-face the -face seminar, but we're trying to think creatively and figure out if there's a way that if we have... Uh, this year or other future years where we're unable to bring people to gather here into the United States together, are there ways that we could offer a, not, not the same experience, obviously, because there's, you only get a certain unique experience by being together, learning from each other, sharing information over those, you know, those however many days the seminar lasts, going to the field, visiting, seeing the sites. But we're trying, like many people, uh, trying to be creative about how to use uh, the online platforms to create online learning opportunities. So at least we're still providing for that capacity building opportunity, uh, bringing people together to share information and ideas. And we're right now looking at the possibility of making our women's leadership seminar uh, still uh, happen this year, but happen uh, in an online platform. And so it'll be, it would be very different. Um, you know, we, uh, our team and our center has always preferred face-to-face uh, -face, uh, training and sharing. I mean, the, the, the platform of the seminar of getting people together and learning from each other and, and seeing everybody's face and, and, and the warmth that everybody brings and the new ideas. I mean, that's, that's why we went into this, in, into this line of work and it's what brings us um, so much inspiration and uh, keeps us going every year. And so we're struggling a little bit to think about what the future might look like if it takes a while for us to get back to being able to do seminars face to face. Um, what other opportunities might we have? And, and interestingly enough, uh, uh, Julio, the, um, we've uh, started a new partnership through our center with um, the Cesar Chavez Environmental Corps, which is one of these conservation corps that's. Um, that uh, was developed by uh, an organization that uh, a famous um, Mexican immigrant to the United States uh, cr created called The Field, which is the uh, Farm Workers Institute for Education and Leadership Development. And they formed um, a conservation corps as well that helps people that are transitioning either to U.S. citizenship, our first generation, or come from 
uh, more rural, poor families that are that are that have typically been farm workers throughout most of their lives or past generations, and provide them with opportunities to get experience in natural resources, to get out into the into the workforce, to visit uh, protected areas, and so we've developed a recent new partnership. This is another kind of new opportunity or idea that we've developed recently to help provide training to them virtually as they prepare to engage in these CCC activities in California right now. Now, many of which are oriented around, around getting food and delivering food to people in need. So these are crews of people that are used to going out and building trails and building infrastructure. And what they've done is repurpose their ideas so they can figure out, well, how can we go and get food from where the food's available and deliver it to the people who need the food? And so we're seeing some of that and, and we're looking forward to getting a little more involved in the, in the CCC space and, uh, and um, providing some training there. So those are a couple of things that we're thinking about as our center and, and how we adapt to, to this. Um, the budgets are going to be very challenging for some time. Um, at our university in general, we're seeing probably a 10 to 20% cut. And when you get to 10 to 20% uh, cuts, you, you, you know you're, you're talking about not just um, <clears throat> cutting discretionary funds, but you're also probably talking about cutting people. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see how things develop uh, uh, on that front as well. Any other ideas from anyone out there? Ryan, um, can I? Like... Can you sure, hear me? But... Yeah. So, yeah, Jim, you go ahead first, and then after Jim, we'll go to Uyen. Okay. Uh, several things, folks. The, the first is to take advantage of this time to invest in yourselves and your teams. There are more and more opportunities, many of them with absolutely no cost, extremely limited cost, for training online. Uh, things as simple as your language training using free tools like Duolingo and other things that are similar. Uh, uh, t like for example, on our team, we're uh, renewing our Red Cross first aid certifications and also looking for other types of short courses we can take that are now offered online. So investing in your teams and yourselves, obviously also in your physical health. I've lost 20 pounds working out every day. And also thinking about not only personal maintenance, about maintenance of your physical plant. For many of us, this is a great time to be thinking about vehicle maintenance, about buildings, about simple repairs, and ways of investing not only in our team, our human team, but also in being prepared for when we do reopen, be it a community, an NGO, or a government agency, to make sure that we're investing in maintenance for the long run. Uh, another thing is to... Uh, make sure that your, your reopening strategies are coordinated with local health and other authorities at the municipal or regional level, national level, so that you're not making plans that are not in sync with those of the government agencies on reopening. Uh, so you're not seen as someone who's going across purposes to national strategies. A third, and Ryan alluded to this and Julio, is many countries are obviously going to go through an unemployment crisis. Our unemployment in the United States it has its highest level in 80 years. And so one thing that governments tend to do in those periods is create employment generation strategies. So I think there's gonna be a lot of them in many countries. So take advantage of them to create these civil conservation corps if they don't, if they don't exist and also to bolster your volunteer programs. There's a lot of people with a lot more time on their hands now that might be willing to do things that can be done while socially distanced. The other thing is obviously, and we're gonna be talking about that in a webinar on Friday, diversify your financial strategies away from tourism and also uh, diversify tourism sectors and plan for that. And finally, uh, particularly if you have an economy that is extremely dependent on tourism, what are the other things you do? What are the other services you provide? Do you provide potable water? Are there hydropower plants that depend on your protected area? Uh, are, do you have mangroves that are a coastal barrier against erosion and storms? Uh, are you a high biodiversity place? Uh, are you important for research and other environmental services? So basically work on developing the rationale for your existence and what you and your agency does to include other services they provide for society and not just tourism. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Let's, uh, Uyen had a comment. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me this time? 
Yeah, you sound clear. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in our country, uh, in our case, Gaia Nature Conservation, last year our income mostly come from our field trip camps and forest plantation, but with the participation of the people. And this year, with the COVID and all of our camps are cut down. So it means all of our main income is cut down. Uh, so we switched to a new format of uh, the forest uh, plantation. Uh, in the past, people had to join us to plant the trees, but now people can just contribute uh, money so that we can go plant the tree. So because of that, uh, in the past a few months, we can still keep planting trees and we can still like uh, try to raise some funds to maintain our activities. Uh, but based on this situation, I can foresee that the tourists can never become as normal as before. At least in the next few years, uh, people are not ready to pay, are not ready to go on field trip. People are scared of the nature. So we are now trying to navigate our activity to try to change it to other, like diverse, uh, diversity, the funding, and uh, develop new activities uh, that doesn't require a lot of people to participate. Uh, for example, for the activity in the school, uh, in the past we used to think that there would be some activity for the whole school to participate and now we will try to organize it in class only so that it doesn't require a lot of people to concentrate. Uh, but it is still a challenge somehow. But um, I really, really think that any other organization that had the opportunity to diversify the funding to change it, then this is a time that we have to think about change the activity to something that doesn't need any like a lot of people gathering together. Yeah, that is our case. Yeah, thanks. Can Lee. you hear me? Yeah, very challenging yeah. situation when 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 your whole revenue stream uh, all of a sudden disappears. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I, I'll share a link with you afterward. There's a, there's some really interesting experiences in the, the California state park system uh, in the U.S. I was on a webinar recently that was held by the uh, National Association for Interpretation about how California has redesigned all of its field trips to be online. And so these are virtual mm -hmm. field trips. And so obviously normally it wouldn't be the same, but you have these kids that are all learning at home. And so they're looking for an other opportunities. The parents need help to, to have some. And so for those kids that do have some internet access at home, um, they've been able to provide these virtual field trips that you can download and watch online to any of the California state parks. So I can share, once we're done here, I'll share the link to that on the uh, WhatsApp group so that anybody can take a look at that resource, okay? Um, it looks like Julio has some comments. Yeah, um, it would be a quick um, uh, comment on this uh, topic of the civilian corps. Um, I, I'm really, really inspired by this idea and uh, I've been even, I researched a little bit more on the one that happened between 32 and 42 in the U.S. And um, just uh, ask if you um, have any um, more specific ideas or, or actions uh, you could do uh, helping us or even uh, connecting with Isami Bio here to give him this idea because um, you, you also know that we have um, a really unbrained um, uh, heads in the Isami Bio and the federal government here, but uh, I, I'm looking. Uh, a way to bring this uh, idea, not even just uh, to my place, but, but national wide uh, thinking on the unemployment and uh, the need we need to, to build new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, J J I'm, I'm happy to, to add a few comments, but I'd like to see if Jim uh, would be willing to respond to that. He, he's uh, got a lot of experience with that and actually helped Honduras create a civil conservation course. So Jim, if you want to respond, that would be great. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, Julio, my father was in that conservation corps in the 1930s. Uh, he was a coal miner, a deep coal miner, and it got him out of the mines and saved his life. 
and he lived 30 years longer than his own father. So I'm a testament. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a conservation corps, probably. Uh, and it produced uh, uh, millions of jobs. And many of the trails and overlooks and picnic shelters built in the 1930s by this corps, because they were built by hand with hand tools and with lots of love, they're still out there. My father took me to show me infrastructure he built 70 years or 60 years after it had been built. Pretty amazing. So I, I'm a firm believer in the program. There's actually a national organization, Julia, we can follow up later, called the Core Network, which is a nationwide institution of all the cores because the current model in the United States is not one centralized national agency like it was uh, when it started 80 years ago, but rather a network of local conservation corps that do receive federal funding as well. So it's much more decentralized. And the other thing is that the core varies. Some of them are only for poor people. Some of them are focused on tribal nations. Some of them are only for youth that have gotten in trouble with the law. Uh, but most of them are open to anyone. And Erin uh, uh, can also comment because she was a participant in core in California. But I do think it's a wonderful idea. And this is an appropriate time with the need for employment generation to help us deal with the unemployment issue around many protected areas. And also, as Julio mentioned, deal with the uh, infrastructure needs of these protected areas as well. Erin, did you wanna add something based on your experience? Thank you, Jim. And Julia, I'm really excited that you're thinking about this and I would love to talk more in detail. Maybe our team could have a call with you and, and just uh, share more about the experience. But I, um, I have experience with the California Conservation Corps, which was closely based off of the Civilian Conservation Corps. It's been in existence for, I think, over 40 years now. And they have a well-established program. There's a lot of benefits to conservation cores, not only for the participants, the, the young adults that participate in them, but also provides reduced cost labor, skilled labor to, for, um, for the uh, protected area agencies at the federal, state, and municipal level. So they, they have relationships, uh, contracts with state parks, with uh, national parks, with municipal parks, to provide a lot of the maintenance and construction that they require, as well as their uh, restoration and conservation work. And um, California and their Conservation Corps has a very uh, uh, elaborate system with, uh, with uh, centers where, uh, where the core members live based throughout the state. The state's a very big state. And so there are live-in centers um, from Southern California all the way up to Northern California, from Eastern to Western. And then there are also centers where people commute to work. They don't live at the center, but they will drive to the center and work, excuse me, work each day. Um, it's also, it's a community uh, and young adult education program. So people that do not, have their GED or their high school diploma can concurrently work on that. They provide a lot of supplemental education and benefits additionally include um, getting certifications such as your chainsaw certification, such as your fire, wildland firefighting certification, et cetera. Um, and they have partnered with AmeriCorps, which is an organization here in the US that uh, provides uh, provides an opportunity for young adults and adults practically of any age to gain uh, professional experience and also volunteer for their country for they do receive some type of stipend to to do this volunteer work um, and so AmeriCorps supports some special programs for that Conservation Corps and I could go um, on um, with more details, but it's it, it, it's really a super impactful experience uh, for those that participate in it. And I think it's a great benefit for also the, the, the natural resource management agencies that need uh, the, the work. So it, it, it saved Jim Barbarak's father's life because he was working in a coal mine. Well, it also saved Aaron Hicks's life because Aaron was working on a, on a, in a skyscraper in New York City. That's true. Drawing car cartoon, cartoon characters for Nickelodeon and about to go crazy in this. The Conservation Corps helped her get out and start doing trails and other things that led her to us. So we feel like it also helped save her life. Um, Section right. Tom, uh, I think has a, had a question or a comment to make as well. Um, Tom, we'd welcome your input.
We see your video, but you're still on mute. There you go. I even, I even, I'm, I even don't see my video myself. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for all your inputs. I just uh, uh, went through the reflection questions, and I thought um, perhaps I could touch uh, one or two things uh, that so far so good happened in our consultancy, that is Kalama, uh, during the pandemic uh, period. Um, uh, one of the approaches uh, we have made is to ensure that in all the entries, uh, all the bases, uh, all the offices, blocks, we have put containers there, soaps, sanitizers, and we have basic, and we have basic, uh, we, uh, we have basic uh, policies that we have put in place that should be observed. Uh, also, uh, we have encouraged all the staff that who feels to go for uh, for an annual leave to apply now because there is much less uh, we can do at the moment uh, in the conservancy. So those who have taken perhaps an off to go circumcise their boys because it's, you know in our Samburu culture this is the season for circumcising uh, uh, boys. Uh, we have encouraged them to apply for two more weeks to make it an annual leave. Uh, so that when we get back to business, at least we have full outs uh, a number of staff. Uh, also, on the because we are now having a zero, almost zero revenue in this uh, second quarter, it means uh, emergency funds, the bursary fund uh, are not available. Normally, what we do in case we have people. Uh, locked in hospital because of uh, a hefty bills, we normally step in and pay for, for our locals uh, to be released. We would also engage in many other charity programs for the churches, uh, for, for school trips uh, or staff and things like that. But at the moment, we don't have uh, uh, the finances uh, because of the pandemic. So the community is suffering a lot and uh, hotels have closed. Uh, uh, and people given unpaid leaves. So what we did is uh, we got some small funding of invasive species clearing, uh, about 70,000 USD. And the donor had the window when this has to be utilized. So we saw trying to give a COVID-19 pandemic uh, situation to the donor, uh, it was a little bit bureaucratic. And just letting this money go back, we had to approach our county government COVID-19 task force mm -hmm. and let them understand. So we had to lay down uh, basic tenets on how we are going to approach this. How are we going to pull out 510 people inside a concentration camp, clearing 1,200 hectares of land? So we subdivided that into 10 people uh, per unit, resulting to about mm -hmm. uh, 40 units and uh, a number of supervisors uh, whom many more were, were in different categories. Some were actually uh, just uh, monitoring if the work is being done the right way to create the impact of clearing. Others who are monitoring COVID-19. We also employed health workers to keep on uh, reaching out to many people uh, in small, small units, trying to sensitize them about uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, the basic tenets uh, on prevention measures. Um, about our, uh, our mm -hmm. visitation numbers uh, is going to decimate uh, the whole of uh, second quarter. That quarter is normally the best, that it contributes about 65% uh, of our annual revenues. And it seems very bleak. We, we don't know when these uh, things are going to pick uh, mm -hmm. back to normal. And uh, it's like the entire year is going to be affected because uh, when we try to follow international media, they keep talking of January. That is when uh, the vaccine is going to be available, perhaps. Uh, and even when the vaccine is going to be available, it means uh, the COVID is still going to be there with us. Uh, and despite the fact that the vaccine is there, people may still get affected and keep on losing people uh, and keep on seeing damages of their sorts uh, as a result. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the, the contributions and, and we wish you good luck too, also, as, as we do with everybody in the, these challenging times. Yeah. Um, anybody else uh, want to chime in uh, from around the world? Um, Ryan? Yeah, Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have also, uh, I just wanted to comment uh, about the, that you said uh, the California uh, is visual, I don't know how to say visual visiting or something. It's also happened in Myanmar, but it is not uh, happened in this COVID-19 period. It's already happened you know, just before uh, in, the, in, in, in the past time. But uh, the, the, uh, the, the youth, uh, they are trying uh, to do the visual video and, you know, like the team share uh, uh, video, they are, uh, we can visit through the, our computer or internet. We don't need to go uh, outside of the, uh, you know, we don't need to go uh, to places. Uh, mm -hmm. But they're trying to propose to the, to the government, you know, to, to make it happen. They, they do a lot, you know, with their menu, with their, you know, device and machine, you know, with, the, with, the, with their own menu, they propose to the government. But it's uh, some of the uh, popular uh, uh, places are free to go and visit there, but some are very, uh, they, they, they still make it happen. But uh, in the middle of the time, they are trying to propose to the government. But, uh, you know, uh, the government, I mean the agency, not the government, the related government, they cannot, uh, they are not updated, you know. Uh, they, it's, it's hard to, understand those you know updated things technology so they they put it aside but uh, uh most of the youth they can access those kind of those kind of you know uh, visualization so this is one thing for another thing is myanmar is uh i know i'm not quite sure in us there is only home quarantine but in myanmar we have a two quarantines one is home quarantine and another, another one is facility quarantine. You know, if you are uh, positive or, you know, you are uh, suspend, uh, you, you are not, if you are suspended, you have to be put in the facility quarantine. All the causes like facility quarantine or if you are hospitalized, everything, uh, medical treatments are free in Myanmar. So that's why people are coming back to Myanmar because all the causes are free. Government are supporting, you know, free. So they all are coming back to Myanmar, especially uh, people who are migrating. Even like, for example, like some, some of the U.S. citizens, they are families, but U.S. citizens, they are coming back to Myanmar and taking treatment. Those kind of things are happening. But the government, they don't have budget, honestly. So um, all the migrants, like working in the Thailand, um, uh, China, uh, Malaysia, there are uh, thousands of people, thousands of migrants, they are coming back. So those are put in the facility quarantines. In Myanmar, uh, the quarantine is uh, 21 days. After you are, uh, you know, 21 days in facility quarantine, you have to, uh, after tested, if you are staying negative, you have to be again in home quarantine after 21 days in facility quarantine. So in total, the quarantine will be 28 days. So apart from the home quarantine, all the causes, even if you are positive, if you are hospitalized, everything is, uh, you know, free. So the government, um, it costs a lot, honestly. So they, some of the budget, they are going to the, go through the um, organization or assemblies, something like, um, uh, you know, related to, uh, to tourism, tourism center. So everything is expensive. The, for, for, you know, half of the money, uh, the people are supporting to the government. They announced, honestly, announced, I mean, the, the ladies are uh, the outdoor uh, outdoor city, uh, you know, announced, we are poor, we don't have budget, but uh, all the, uh, you know, hospital calls, all the tests that are free, so people know, people are aware of that, that's why we are also not, you know, rich, but uh, we try to donate to the 
our government. So for time being, we are going, <laughs> we are we are going like that. But uh, we are we don't know we don't know what to do. You know, we don't know what will happen. You know? But for for uh for for the time being, the kids are you know stay uh in you know. 176 positive cases. It's lower and lower, but um, we don't know what to do yet. Uh, this is one thing for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, you know. Um, wait, wait, wait a second. Oh, for the um, public areas, uh, as uh, for the protected area, it's already visited. You know, since before. Uh, uh, most of the protected area are not uh, people are not allowed to go there. So um, they visiting the 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 places people usually uh, visit are cultural places. Uh, those cultural uh, cultural places are closed down, and and yeah, we we have this kind of step. So for the another thing is uh, learning online. Um, honestly, I'm not, uh, getting used to. Uh, those uh, learning online because we are um, very used to uh, learning face to face. So even now, um, uh, I am learning online, uh, which is from the uh, American Center. You know, everything is difficult for me, but I also uh, learn very uh, new things like you know everything we have to serve ourselves. The 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 tutor gave some assignment. Uh, he just explained uh, a little bit, uh, a little of the, uh, you know, the, the things. But we have to serve our, uh, search ourselves for everything to, <laughs> to to finish our assignment. So these kind of things we are improving. So now I can, I can say, uh, you know, uh, self study is improving for all of us. And also, uh, we, uh, I can see people are changing behavior in Myanmar because. Uh, previously, we are not quite aware of the, you know, um, uh, pet pet care. We don't know, you know, we, we know um, we don't know how to take care of ourselves. For example, we have a very bad habit. Like if you are going to the street, uh, you 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 split easily on the street. You don't care about others, you know. You don't care about um, spreading the. Uh, you know, sp uh, spreading the virus, or you know, do, uh, we don't care. People, this is you know, they are heavy. But now people are, you know, aware of that. Uh, they are aware of taking uh, protein max. Um, those kind of behavior are changing, and also they are reading more about, uh, you know, they are they are sanitization or you know, all the health. They are uh, related with their health. Healthcare, the people are reading more and more. So this kind of behavior are changing. I mean, the people they are quite aware of the you know head, head, and they uh, understand uh, all the things. One thing in Myanmar is people they are willing to listen um, government instructions and government. Uh, announcement. If the government saying you don't do that, so people are listening. You don't do that. We have a very nationwide celebration like uh, Myanmar New Year and like um, you know Dengje uh, or other festival. It's nationwide. The whole country is celebrating. Us. For the this year, this is very very first time people are not going out. They listen to government instruction, and government is reminding all the time. We cost a lot. We cost a lot. Uh, we are poor, so you are the key to change everything. You are the key to let them the cup. Or so the government is you know reminding all the time. So people are uh, we listen or not listen to. Uh, we have to listen all the time. All the uh, you know, TV and all the channels. Uh, the lady is, you know, um, demonstrating how to wash the hands. Or all the things are, you know, she's reminding all the time. So even we don't listen. Uh, it's we are hearing all the time. Now people are. I can say uh, behavior are changing. Uh, for the natural resource, uh, for the I mean for the protected area, it's what I see is is. It's not that much change because we already we are already visited that not to go to the 
uh, protected area apart from the cultural area. So this is the uh, you know some of the opportunity and some of the things in Myanmar. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Keen, for, for providing that update. Um, we, we had in mind to try to close the call around 8.30 uh, our time, which is just about five minutes ago. But before we close off, we, I do want to provide an opportunity for Paul, who is just now joining us, to see if he can uh, turn his audio on. And just, Paul, if you would provide us with a brief update on how things are going in Indonesia and how things are going with you. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, first of all, I always uh, I would say thank you very much for uh, the opportunity uh, you give to me. Uh, I'm sorry for being late. Uh, Join the meeting. <coughs> uh, first of all, I will uh, say my uh, condolences for uh, one of pilot uh, today have. A Trace of airplane who came from uh, Colorado, and <clears throat> I personally so sad because it's very close to, to my home. But um, if a question still finish and then finish it, then uh, yeah, I personally believe that he sees uh, in heaven now. Uh, <clears throat> Today in Indonesia is, uh, according to the um, coronavirus ca case, is around uh, 14,000 uh, started from uh, March until now, and uh, especially in my region is around uh, 300, and it was infected all of the sector in Indonesia, especially in Papua, and. Uh, many of the uh, tourism part are closed because of um, the government give a regulation to um, make a social distancing and then close everything here. No activities uh, outside home and, and then um, so society have to quarantine uh, self at home and then we cannot uh, go around. Um, uh, I saw that um, tourism in Papua, especially in um, local tribes, it was uh, very difficult for local tribes to make money. And what my institution uh, do is uh, uh, because they pay, um, I mean, local production from uh, local tribe uh, who live close with um, tourism area, uh, local production like meals, oil, and um, yeah, something like that. And what my institution do is for, um, give opportunity to uh, local people to make money because uh, the situation is very hard for many people uh, including local people to make money and <clears throat> uh, until now uh, we already uh, buy uh, all of the uh, local production uh, Furthermore, my um, institution uh, already saving money, saving budgeting, I mean, saving budgeting uh, because of coronavirus and then we cannot do it. We can, we can do some activities in the tourism area because of uh, uh, our uh, government didn't give opportunity to work outside, outside uh, the room because uh, the cases of coronavirus in my region has sharply increased in uh, right now. And <clears throat> what my institution uh, decided to do is actually about um, how local people 
can adapt the situation and then they still um, keep the natural resources in the tourism area it's like uh, make a patrol together with a, a volunteer who come from uh, uh, local people uh, the local people which is very close with the area give information for my institution about uh, uh, resource in the tourism area and <clears throat> until now uh, relationship with uh, local people and then my institution are going well and then <clears throat> and in the future we we, we need uh, more budgeting for um, Ministry of environment and forestry especially about uh, outside activities who support uh, tourism in Papua because in Papua we have three sides of um, tourism uh, as we call a natural uh, natural tourism perceive area so uh, overall um, the situation in Papua, according to according to coronavirus, are uh, increasing sharply. But until now, uh, the tourism tourism side are closed. But local people still uh, still keep the natural resources. I think that's all I would like to say. Thank you, Rian. Thank you, Paul, for, for joining us. And thank you, you have the, the toughest schedule to join us. It's, I think you, it's the latest where you are of everybody. So we, we got the earliest here and you got the latest. So it's always hard to find a time that can work for such a diverse group like we have uh, with us today. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, really, we'd just like to bring the, uh, this webinar to a close. Um, it's been really, um, heartwarming and inspiring to hear from all of you uh, just reconnecting and knowing that you all are doing well and and uh, in in uh, working on these challenges in each of your different corners of the world I think helps bring us all closer together makes us realize we're part of a much broader network and that together we all we will be able to get through this this is perhaps the one of the defining moments of our lifetimes that uh, we're going to be uh, learning from and adapting to for for many many years to come um, we really enjoy having you part of our network and look forward to finding additional ways that we can uh, continue to provide support so uh, be on the lookout for our other webinars that we'll be having um, over the coming months we hope many of you will also be able to join um, more than anything, we hope you and your families stay healthy and safe during this time. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us anytime if we can provide some, some technical support or, or other support. Uh, we, we're happy to stay in touch and look forward to staying in touch um, in any ways that we can. So uh, keep your loved ones safe. Uh, follow, follow the Follow the guidelines that are coming out in each of your regions of the world and uh, hopefully together uh, we're all going to come through this and and uh, and maybe we as we come through this we can reconstruct the world in a, in a little bit more of a sustainable fashion uh, with the environment in mind so with that we'd like to thank you all for joining the webinar a big virtual coronavirus free hug from all of us here in Colorado um, we wish you all the best and please do stay in touch Take care, everybody.